Today, I am talking with Jessica Willis. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. Well, this is exciting. And uh, your current venture is called Pocket Nest, which is an app for Gen X and millennial uh, folks to learn financial habits. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Pocket Nest? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, Pocket Nest is a financial wellness app. We license our software uh, to financial institutions, so banks and credit unions, for them to use with their end community. Um, and then we also license our software to employers as an employee wellness, financial wellness benefit. Um, we are a startup. We launched uh, maybe three years or three and a half years ago now. Um, we are uh, in a bunch of institutions. We're a full-time team. We're venture-backed. We are working our tails off and having a blast. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So as the founder of Pocket Nest, um, you're normally interviewed about Gen X and millennial financial habits. Uh, and you have your experience as a CFP, you're a money expert, you're now a fintech founder. But here, we want to dive into how you're thinking about raising your own kids money smart. Like, how does someone like you who really does know her stuff about finance, how does someone like you deal with kind of family finance at home? And so without being afraid to kind of get into the weeds, because that's what we do here on this show, can you just tell us a little bit about how you go about teaching your kids money smart at the Willis home? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I just want to start off by saying I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. I think just the littlest bit of intentionality is a good start. And I say that because in the very early days, um, here I am, this, you know, quote, financial expert. And I remember when my my kids were much younger, um, this like I, this hesitation to just start. It was like, do we do an allowance? We don't do an allowance. Should we do chores? Should we pay them? All the stuff that felt so overwhelming, it left um, us and, and me in particular in a paralyzed situation until I could felt like I could get it perfect. We didn't do anything. And all of a sudden, it, I realized that, you know, my kids would, um, and by the way, my kids now are 13, 10, and 7. Um, but maybe five or six years ago, they would come home from school with the little book orders or, you know, candy cane outlet. And, and so they would start to do chores around the house to get money. And I found myself just kind of handing them money for, you know, cleaning the stairs. It was, it just didn't feel right. So I thought, all right, you know, we might be getting it wrong, but let's try something. Um, and so what we did is we started doing a, a, a low allowance, $3 a week per child. Um, we did the money jars. So I was so entertained to see, John, that that you do that too, um, and you recommend that. But we had money jars, save, spend, share. Um, actually, it was save, spend, charity. Um, and a dollar would go into that each week. And so we've been doing that ever since. And they, they are definitely um, learning, I think, they're on the right trajectory. I've been um, really proud of the way that they're they're savers now. Um, and you know, they still buy stupid stuff once in a while, but um, they're learning. Well, I mean, that buying of the stupid stuff is part of the whole process, right? You it know, is. we've got to let them kind of practice and make mistakes because we all buy some stupid stuff. And really, the only way to learn is to buy our own stupid stuff. And yeah. uh, if we do that when they're young, they're much lower stakes mistakes. You mentioned a few things that I just wanted to point out that I thought were really good is one, that intentionality. It's like, you know, getting started with a program, not worrying about it being perfect. That intentionality really does matter. And the other thing you matter, you mentioned that I thought was uh, really good is this idea of the handing, uh, handing the money. Because I was actually talking about this with my one of my daughters. Uh, we were talking about she still gets an allowance. She's 17 years old. And she was saying how some of her friends don't get an allowance, but she's noticed that their parents are handing them money. And at least when you're giving your kids money in an allow in a, in, as an allowance, then it's their money. They're going to be more careful about it. And I thought it was interesting that she saw that. Of course, you know she's been get, she's gotten allowance for a long time, so it's not surprising. And that we talk about it a lot. But that idea that if you're not doing it, you're 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 just have no control over the money then that's being given out, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I felt like I was doing the right thing because I wasn't in my, at first, it felt like I wasn't just handing them money. I was saying, okay, you need to, you know, pick one of these chores, clean the floor, or whatever was age appropriate, wipe the table. But I knew yeah. they had these, these goals of, I want to spend $20 on the book, you know, the book fair items. 
So it was kind of like, all right, I'll give you the $20 for what was probably a 10 minute job. So it, it just, it was almost like there was no, um, I can't help but say this, but we weren't creating a, a, a rational economy at home, right? We were just kind of doing things ad hoc. So yeah, I think the the allowance um, has created some consistency and some some economy. Yeah, that makes sense. So thinking about your kids, like what are you confident, most confident about teaching your kids money smart currently? Like what, what do you feel fairly strong about? I think of, since we started the allowance, um, I think they've learned healthy spending habits. And um, I'm saying that one specifically because their, their economy, their market is to go to the dollar store. That's what they love to do. You know, stuff is pretty inexpensive. Again, there's lots of, um, I want to say low quality items that they come home with, but a lot of the things they're buying, I'm seeing, you know, they're using for art projects that they want to do just for fun, or they're using for gifts for their friends. They're, they're, they, so I think they are learning healthy, healthy spending, um, a healthy spending pattern right now. Yeah. So they're learning to make those kind of choices, right. With money. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that, that's good. And I, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And uh, what sounds like you're doing, which is good, is just is giving them that, uh, that, that rain to kind of figure out what it is they're going to be buying. The other thing I think is good is that if they're going to the dollar store, it's kind of like my wife introducing uh, our kids to thrift store shopping, which I think they inevitably would have found. It's, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's a big thing with this generation, but it's such a good uh, it's a good habit for them to develop is the idea that you can go and and do thrift store shopping uh, or dollar store shopping, that there are choices that you're making right up front about where you're going to do your shopping that are going to help make a difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they've learned to compare. So there's, there's things that they've seen in, in non-dollar stores, right. That, that, you know, we're out and about and, or they may be on vacation. They see something, a $20 water bottle. Well, you know, I've said to them, Look, let's take a quick peek at how much something like that might be on Amazon. So I think they're learning that, you know, different things can cost different amounts. And yes, you're going to, they know they're going to suffer quality at the dollar store because we talked to them about that, but, um, but they're learning that there's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be intentional and smart about shopping, spending. I like what you said there about the, the quality issue. Cause I think that's, that is really important that people understand that, you know, it's, our kids understand that, you know, it's not just about cheap or you have to understand what's cheap and then just what's frugal, right? Because you might buy something very, that's inexpensive, but in the end might end up costing you more because you have to buy replacement items for those things. So that's a, that's a good uh, concept to introduce them to. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, what are you concerned about or what do you feel like you're worried about when it comes to teaching your kids money smart? And this could be currently or it could be kind of in the future. Yeah. Well, I thought of this as I was reading your your book. Um, the quick, easy answer is, are they are they are they inclined to be charitable? Um, I don't think that's something that comes naturally to well, I think children are givers, but it, but that, you know, when they know the option is to put money in their bank or to give it away, I think my kids feel, they feel very forced into putting money in the charity jar. So something yeah. we haven't done that I, I read in your materials is we didn't give them any autonomy with where to put their money. Everything was, you know, you get $3, $1 goes in each jar. And so the response I've gotten from them, which again, you put this in your book is you only give us $1 of allowance because you make us put the other dollar in our bank and the other dollar goes to charity. So that's something I'm going to, to change. But, um, but that was my easy answer. I think the harder thing is um, I, the, the, the long-term savings, the savings for, you know, what, what we think of as saving for retirement. Um, that's the piece I have yet to see my kids demonstrate. I think they're not spending their last dollar. They know not to do that, but I think they're saving that last dollar for just in case they want to buy something else at the dollar store versus, you know, saving for a car or when they're 16 or saving for college. So I don't know if that just comes as they get older, but I'm not seeing them think, you know, retirement at age 12. And again, maybe that just comes later. Yeah, I I think <laughs> this is it's a, this, this is great because I, I was just having this conversation um, turns out with my sister, because we were, uh, she has uh, now, uh, 
and I should know it's five or six. <laughs> it's five. You're gonna get I'm going to I'm gonna have to cut that out. <laughs> so, yeah, so there, I should know. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Um, but the uh, this idea that uh, the long term savings, because the for kids, because there was this idea. I remember reading in the Time Life book of family finance from the '60s. It was this idea of saving for a rainy day, which I think we both would agree it's just way too abstract. And when I talked to David Owen, who's a writer who wrote the first National Bank of Dad. He really, which was very influential on, on what I was doing in my book uh, as well. He said, you know, it's a, basically that's just like taking money away from kids if you're saving for that kind of long term. Similar to what you said about mandating things like going into the to the to the uh, to the share jar, and I think it's going to be different for different kids. This is where we want to figure out how we can because every kid is different. Some kids are going to be more charitably inclined. Some kids are going to be uh, less charitably, in charitably inclined. I think the way that I always think about the share jar is we just have to keep track of the fact that money is there and then help them find opportunities to use that money, um, whether it's something that's going on at school, whether it's you know the UNICEF box during Halloween or you know whatever it might be. We just have to kind of keep them aware of that. Um, but it, you bring up a very good point because they may look at it as, well, you're not, you're only giving me X amount of allowance, yeah. you know, minus the stuff that you're saying I can't use. Right. And right. I, I think this is, that's why, that's why it's the, called the art of allowance is that you just have to kind of figure out how that's going to work with, and it's, it can be different with each kid. Um, I think the other thing about long-term savings with your point to your point is we can maybe incentivize them by doing some kind of matching with the money so they can see their money grow a little bit more. But even then, you know, as I mean, as a CFP and a money expert, like even as adults, it's really hard for us to conceptualize and to think uh, of our future selves effectively. And so it's, I, right. I think it's, I understand your frustration because I feel the same frustration with my kids, even at 19 and 17, um, that, you know, we wish they were saving more, but all we can do is show them these habits and then continue to talk to them about the power of, you know, compounding and wow. that these things will in the end be useful to you. And then when they get their first job, we might step in and help them out and suggest that, you know, make sure there's, a, if there's a company matching plan, you're maxing that, you know, there's just a lot we can, uh, yeah. we can do. Yeah. John, don't you think that's one of those two that, I mean, my hope is that that's one of those where they're learning by watching, you know, you can only be so with in parenting, you can only tell them so much and they, they, they pick up a lot more. We know this, they, they pick up a lot more and they build their habits more from watching what you do. So, you know, I think especially on the charity side, um, and, and I know this about you too, because of reading your book, my husband and I are, are, are consider ourselves pretty charitable. We always can do more. Um, and I'm hoping that just kind of rubs off on them a little bit. You know, I, I think there's only so much we can do around mandating while trying to give them the autonomy that, you know, is so important. Yeah. I mean, you're touching about this modeling is such a key aspect of what we're going through and, and, when we're trying to raise our money smart kids on this journey. So I think you're totally right. And actually, I think one of the cool parts about going through the process is you can adjust your own behaviors if necessary, right? To uh, to be a better model for your kids. I, I'm I'm much better model, I think, now than I was when we first started out because you kind of, you see what doesn't make sense to you when you start talking to your kids about money. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yes, I found that out by, uh, I remember when my oldest was probably three and we were at Trader Joe's grocery store and she was saying, oh, I need this. And it was, you know, chocolate cereal or something, but she used the word need. And I thought, oh, I know where that comes from, right? When you're shopping, oh, oh we need milk. Oh, we need this. So yeah, they they definitely pick up on that. That's a great point. And, and it's the idea, because we, we really don't realize so many of the things we're saying until our kids parrot it back to us. And it's okay. Like a lot of times we'll beat ourselves up about it, but we're better off just saying to them saying, Oh yeah. Okay. That's where you got that. That's really not something you need. And, yeah. and giving them the opportunity to call us on it when we've made that same mistake. You know, I remember 
I've shared the story. Like I remember dropping my iPhone and it breaking and, be, and I turned and I think she was four at the time. And I said, oh, now I need to get a new phone. And she looked at me and said, you don't need a new iPhone. Amazing. <laughs> oh, I love that. Good girl. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's like, uh, can you think of say the, the biggest mistake that you see um, other parents make that you've been around with your other parents that make with kids and money that you kind of wish you could change. And then maybe it's something that you're even thinking about. You might be able to change and help them with, uh, with your own app pocket nest. Like what's something you see that happens a lot. Okay. There's two things. So one, um, it's the same thing we struggled with that paralysis. I think a lot of people, I have friends that, you know, they're still years later struggling with now, how do we do an allowance? Should we do an allowance? This like, I don't know what to do. And so I'm doing nothing. I'm paralyzed that, that I think is, I mean, that's just part of, um, humanity. I think we all do that, but I definitely see that with parents and money. They, they want to teach their children good money habits, but they're too scared to get it wrong. So they're not doing anything. Um, and actually I see that, and this is the second thing I wanted to mention. So my background is all in, in financial planning. I'm a, as you said, a certified financial planner, our platform, the, the thing that's different between pocket nest and we think every other FinTech out there is that it's that comprehensive piece. So we deal with estate planning, we deal with income tax planning, we deal with insurance needs, saving for kids, college, you know, certainly retirement and investments and budget. But, but the idea is that, you know, we're, we, we, if, if the platform knows A, B and C about you, it impacts all of these other pieces of your life versus um, right now they're treated a little bit siloed. If you feel like you need insurance, you're going to start Googling insurance products and you're going to read articles versus something saying, hey, John, we know you have two kids. You know, we know what your situation looks like. Here's the type of insurance. So that's the background I have to share about. Everything we're doing is this comprehensive financial planning and how life events impact other things. So to answer your question, um, the piece I see other parents not doing is again, it, it's that paralysis. In particular, it's around insurance and estate planning. So with estate planning, I think we have this, this miss, you know, this thought that it's only for the wealthy. Um, we have this thought that, you know, until you have um, millions and millions of dollars in investable assets, you don't need an estate plan. You don't need to talk to an attorney. And I will say, you know, if you don't have significant investments or, or net worth, maybe you don't need a joint trust and a complex complex estate plan review. And maybe you can even get away with getting estate plan documents, not through an attorney, but online. But what I'm seeing is people paralyzed around estate planning. You know, someone has children and they feel like, well, I don't, of course, right? I don't know who I want to watch my children if something would happen to me. And so instead we, we just, we file that away. Um, I have friends who have a friend who has three kids and every time she's had children, they're about the same age as mine. So over the last decade, I get an email, can you give me the name again of that estate attorney? You know, to this day, she still hasn't done the documents. And and it's because it's a, it's a horrible, you know, painful thing to think about, but my goodness, think about the other side of that. So, um, so that's what I've seen a lot is people just being, feeling too paralyzed to do something like get the right insurance, you know, or the right estate planning that they just don't do it. And um, they're not there to be, you know, over product sales. They really are there to be helpful. And so get those things in order. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't agree with you more. I, I We did that mainly because uh, one of our friends who was an estate attorney told us about the, Really, it was it was primarily because of the kids, making sure that the kids are you know, now they're a little bit older. It's not as important, but when they're younger, just thinking through what happens if if something happens to us, yeah. and that's really really important. Yeah. Um, so that's a very good point, and and it's easy to see how people get uh, paralysis um, yeah. over something. And we like did that. too, by the way. Like I, I don't want to be saying we're doing everything. My oldest was 18 months before we signed the estate documents. And they sat on my counter for, for probably nine of those 18 months. I knew it had to be done. Um, it's just a really hard thing to do. So I recognize it's hard, but it's so important. Well, thank you for that, Jessica. So let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's dive into, um, something that's, uh, very, very, um, uh, let's see, let's put it like budgeting. I'll, I'll just, we'll just go there. Right. <laughs> so I know you are a big budgeter. Um, so I asked, it's actually, I, I saw it come up when I was going through and creating my pocket nest profile and I, and I reacted like, Oh, the budget. Um, and so I, 
I asked you to read my essay, you don't yeah. need a budget, right? Yeah. Um, and my purpose in writing the essay was not to suggest that budgeting is bad. It's rather that budgeting need not be that kind of bedrock financial habit that yeah. virtually every expert or program says it should be because most people just react badly to the term budget. And aren't there more important bedrock habits that we should be focus focusing on? And mm -hmm. If you do focus on those, you won't, won't necessarily need a budget. For example, if you pay yourself first, you live beneath your means, combine this with kind of regularly reviewing your expenses, do you really need to budget? Shouldn't these things be the mantra that we are sharing with our kids? And I'll throw it out to you, Jessica. I love it, John. Okay. Um, so you don't know this, but I am not a big budgeter. So I, I read your essay and in, I'm 100% in agreement. So in Pocket Nest, we do have a budget theme. We're actually in the process of updating that theme. So you saw something um, not updated. So we're, we're still in the middle of um, putting code behind it, but the, the, the design and everything is set up. Um, I spent two years interviewing people to see what we needed to do to improve our, our budget theme. And so I would just ask friends, I would ask anybody who would have a conversation with me, tell me about budget. Like, how do you deal with your budget? And every time, John, right, the first response is, ugh, I hate a budget. I don't do my budget. I suck at my budget. You know, there's no like, oh, I love my budget. Yeah, let's talk about that. Literally nobody enjoys budgeting. Yes, you might enjoy going through a spreadsheet and tracking your expenses. I, I, I can understand how certain personality types like that. Nobody likes the budget. Um, like you, because I read your essay, we don't have a budget because we live with below our means. We have, you know, you say pay yourself. Well, well we have automatic savings over to the retirement plans. Um, you know, we know how we're paying down our mortgage. So it's, it's like, we've got those habits in place that I couldn't tell you what I spent on coffee over the last 12 months. And I don't care. And I don't, I wouldn't want anybody to spend time looking that up. Um, but I will say in my early 20s, I did track everything in an Excel spreadsheet because that's what we did, us Gen Xers back then. Um, and I think it was interesting. And I think I learned from that to see, you know, how much my cable bill was each month and how much my phone bill was each month. So I'm sure I built some habits through that. But the way we landed on Pocket Nest and the way we think about budget is that, you um, we think, first of all, the term budget is, is, a, is not the right word, although we use it. It's really cash flow. So we want people to understand in which order their next dollar should go. So we think everybody should understand, um, you know, and we have algorithms in our platform to help educate around this, but it's, you know, first you pay off your high interest credit card debt or have some sort of plan for that um, before you're putting, you know, extra money into the 401k or the, um, the college savings plan. So I think there's an order to these outflows. And I think that's what people need to focus on as long as they can also live under the habit of spending less than you than you make right um yeah. you should have more inflows than outflows so i am 100 percent in line with your way of thinking well good because i uh, not uh, more than anything i i really am trying to figure out what is you know what are those bedrock financial habits and it does seem like it really comes down to this idea that the, the big one is that living beneath your means because it's the hardest thing to do and it's the hardest thing to get across to our kids because they're going to start making money as they go out into the world. And they'll start, you know, they'll steadily, if things work out well, they'll steadily make more and more money. And the danger is that we all tend to move the goalposts. And when right. we move those goalposts, then we get into a situation where we are just, you know, live, we can be either living beyond our means or we've just set it up to, we've set up a situation where now we are, we're beholden to a life that isn't necessarily conducive to a happy life. Um, and the big thing here is it's going to be completely different for different people because people, I don't want everybody to think that we're, you know, you have to live, like I tend to be more minimalist. My point is not to raise two kids who are minimalists. It's really to raise two kids and to help other people 
help their kids figure out how to use money as a tool to craft their lives in the in the best way. And I think by not moving the goalposts, that's one way we do it. I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah. on that. Oh, no, I just love that. I love that. I mean, I, I think your bedrock thoughts of if you're living below your means um, and you're saving for retirement, um, I think the formula works. I think beyond that, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, spending $10 a month at Starbucks or if you're, you know, shopping or whatever it is. Like, I, I think that all falls into place with as long as you have those couple habits. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the, you bring up Starbucks or every, I think one of the key things is that you just need to limit and compartmentalize your luxuries, um, which is so anti the way our culture tends to work. It's so that, I think that's I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's the key point is that it's OK to have some luxuries, but to have everything be a luxury is virtually impossible in, you know, unless you are you know, your means are so far beyond. Yeah. And most of us are not going to get to that, you know, that, yeah. you know, multimillionaire billionaire status. And so figure out what it is that really, that, that you really, that you really want to have. And then, and then try to limit your desires in other ways. Yeah. Um, and I've heard, yeah, you know, I've heard that described. I know Ramit Sethi talks about this kind of concept in his book, I will teach you to be rich. And, and other folks have talked about this idea of compartmentalizing luxuries. Um, does that make sense? It does. And it just reminds me of what you talk about. And I think a lot of us talk about when we talk to our kids are needs versus wants, right? Yeah. There, there's there, the, the wants versus the needs. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. I think that makes a ton of sense. All right. I just want to ask you a few other quick questions before we yeah. get to our fast and fun round. Okay. Who's the most influential person in your life when it comes to the way that you think about money? Um, I should say who has been the most yeah. influential person. So I, the first person that came to my mind, God bless him, is my dad. Um, my dad, and you know, it's interesting because I, I do think growing up, my sister and I had very different spending habits. I think now we're sort of a lot more similar, but um, so I don't even know what they, my parents did to to teach me the financial habits, but um, but I know it came from my dad specifically. And I remember being in in fourth grade, um, and asking him, I was probably driving him crazy, but trying to get him to explain to me how the dollar can be worth not a dollar, you know, in comparison to foreign currencies, um, which is a really hard concept to, to talk about with a child. But I just remember asking him like, that doesn't make sense. Keep going. That doesn't make sense. Keep going until I'm sure he was just frustrated with me. But, you know, <laughs> my parents never handed me money. There, there was um, minor allowance for chores around the house, um, but I can remember one time, solely one time, as children, I mean, this has changed as we're adults and, and they're trying to do more with the family and that sort of thing, but as children, I remember one time my dad handing me a dollar in high school and saying, your, your Slurpee at the mobile gas station is on me today, and I was just blown away, you know, it's just, I remember him handing me that dollar on the driveway because they never just handed us money, although, you know, looking from the outside in, they paid for my college, you know, we were never, we were never wanting for anything. So I think it was, you know, they were covertly teaching us um, frugality. Right. Well, they're, and the, this gets that modeling, you know, certainly if yeah. they're modeling frugality, that's going to, that's going to come through. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. What's, so you talk about fourth grade, what's the earliest memory you have of your parents <laughs> talking to you about money, your dad specifically? Um, I don't remember him not talking about money with us. And it was always like, you know, pick up the penny on the street. And I remember him saying, if you, if you count your pennies, your dollars will grow. If you plant your pennies, your, there's something like that. There was something about dollars growing that his mom told him, my grandma mm. told him. So I remember him telling that to us all the time. Um, my earliest memory is that I got a pink cash box, I think in second grade, um, the code, I mean, you're Gen X, you know, the cash box, right? That little pink cash box <laughs> that we all got, the code was 45. Um, and I was always just dropping money in there. There's always cash in there. So somehow, and I'm sure it was my parents and my dad specifically taught me save, 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 save. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. That point about the, uh, that you don't remember him not talking about it. That sounds so much like my late grandfather to whom I dedicated the book, because he, I think you know, he had this 
I have his little horse. He's called a Black Beauty, where he would save money in this horse. And I said, when did you start saving? And he said, I can't remember a time when I wasn't saving money in that so black awesome. horse. You know, I mean, oh, that's it's so awesome. depression era generation. So that, yeah. you know, that, but it was, that was a, uh, that was an eye opener. Uh, Were you a kid when he, when he told you that? No, this was, uh, I, this, this was when I was creating the money mammals originally. Mm -hmm. and we started talking about it and, um, and he showed me the black beauty and that's, I don't keep a lot of sentimental items. That is one of the few items that I keep around and it's got a prominent place on our shelf just because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a cool, uh, it's a cool reminder of, yeah. of him and, and being uh, money smart and frugal. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. So Jessica, are you ready for the fast and fun round yes. questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. All right. Here we go. Okay. So what does the term money empowered mean to you? Sleeping at night. I think, I think if you're empowered, you can sleep at night and you're not worrying about these one-offs. That is so funny because that is the, that is almost the same answer <laughs> that Bobby Rebel just gave me to the really? same question. Yeah. <laughs> love that. I love that. That is fantastic. Nice. You're both really money smart. So it's not surprising. <laughs> What is the best investment of time or money you've ever spent on your kids? This is this is not a financial answer. This is a um, parenting answer. Whatever it is, is time, not money. So I think, um, and I think that's something, I, I think there's no greater investment that you can give the kids than your time. Your, you know, focused eye contact time, you know, no phones. Um, so I would say any time I've given my children is the best investment I've done. And I need to continue to do more and more of that. Great. Thank you. Okay. So what advice to your kids, um, ostensibly about money, uh, do you most hope that they will heed? Okay. I'm going to tie this to money. I'm going to say, follow your dreams. Like I think my kid, all my kids have very strong entrepreneurial, um, blood they, they're just like they're always trying to do the lemonade stand or door to door something and so I want to tell them I, I can see that I don't want them to ever feel like they can't pursue something that feels amazing and and I'm going to call that related to money as it relates to a career got it you know I'm actually going to take take a detour from our fast and fun round okay. questions because okay. I have two two questions I want to ask you so the first is what as an entrepreneur what do you do to encourage your kids, if anything, um, what do you think you do that uh, as a model or just in terms of actual actions do you do yeah. to encourage their entrepreneurialism? Um, my husband and I often say we've created monsters because he is also, he has his own company as well. And in the beginning, we wanted to encourage it. So we would do like yeah, I have a lemonade stand. I'll buy the lemons and, you know, or the lemonade and, and, you know, I would encourage it. Now they're, they're, they're getting, they're crossing a line a little bit into, um, you know, I, I don't know if there, if there's a line that's too much entrepreneurship, but if there is the Willis kids have it because they're, they're constantly, you know, I'm like, you should donate those books. You don't use them anymore. You know, I have Vietnam vets coming tomorrow. And the response is, no, I'm going to save them for the garage sale and sell them. So there, there's, there's something we, it's cute and it's funny, but there's something we need to address there. And my husband and I are well aware of it. The, uh, the other question, the other detour question I wanted to have, I wanted to ask you was, you know, especially as someone who is a CFP, um, have you introduced your kids to investing yet? And if so, do you have any kind of anything yeah. that's kind of worked well or any suggestions that would be helpful, yeah. I think? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm, I don't know how much time we have. I'll try not to be too long, but yes. Um, and what I'm so proud of what we've done and how it's worked because it's been really interesting and fascinating. So um, we have introduced the kids to investing, um, especially now. We couldn't do this 25 years ago because you had to spend $75 on a trade and you know there were minimums and all this stuff. So now I think all of the broker dealers make it so easy to buy small positions. Um, so what we did last Christmas, um, we gave each of the kids a hundred dollars to put in the stock market. And I sat down with them at dinner one night. I mean, we're having dinner together. So, and my husband 
he's looking at me like I'm crazy, but completely, you know, he was completely on board, but um, definitely this was just me rambling. I said, we're going to give each of you a hundred dollars for Christmas. We're going to put it in, into an account that, that you can put into a stock portfolio. And over one dinner, I explained to them the difference between individual stocks. I explained to them, you know, ETFs and mutual funds um, and cash and bonds. So I don't know if that feels overwhelming to anybody, but it, it, it really isn't all that much. It's just, you know, certain things are riskier than others and you can buy a small piece of a company or you can buy a basket of a bunch of companies through ETFs and mutual funds. So I queued them up with all of that. I said, take some time. You know, I'll show you how to research stocks. They all went to school the next day. Well, the big, the two big kids went to school the next day and apparently talked to their friends. My 10 year old boy came home. He said, I want um, Tesla. Everybody thinks that's the coolest company and Apple. So my boy, and, I, and we explained to him, you know, I'm not promoting anybody buy those stocks, by the way, but we explained to him. <laughs> you know, the risks there. And, and we read to him some of the reviews and what the analysts were saying. Um, but someone told him Elon Musk was a rich guy and, and Peter said, I'm going to follow that guy's lead. So he did that. And then um, my daughter went hundred percent into Apple again, talked to friends. She's at 13. So she wants a phone, right? So like everything is Apple. Mm -hmm. um, and then the seven-year-old, of course, was like barely listening, but she said, you know, yeah, put me in the mutual fund. So it's been really fun to show the three kids how their positions are, are um, you know, offsetting one another, the differences between them. And um, they're not, they're not sitting down and looking up Yahoo Finance every day, but they, they know. And I just, I'm so proud that they know you can buy a piece of a company um, you know, in terms of stocks and, and how that will change. And they're all down in their, you know, their little portfolios, but they're learning. I think they're learning how that works. And then I would say, you know, the, the advice part, I can't not say this is get your toes wet. I think, um, you know, again, don't be scared about getting this wrong. I'm sure all three of my kids are not gonna, gonna, like this money is not going to be substantial to them. But the point is we're investing so that they can learn the, the, you know, the habit and the way the markets work around investment. So that was not as short as I wanted it to be, John, but I had to tell you all of that. <laughs> no, that was uh, chock full of great stuff. And I, I, I think that's, I, I, I think that's terrific. And I, I can see how someone's going to listen to that and be, they're going to sit down at dinner within a week and start doing the same type of all thing. Right. And I, I right. love that idea for a Christmas present. Um, and with regard to disclaimers, I always put a disclaimer at the end of this podcast sure. in terms of financial decision making. So if you're listening, okay. please make sure you listen all the way through. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, these are not these these are not stock recommendations. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're back to. I'm so glad I asked you that question because oh, I would have been kicking myself if I didn't. Good. All right, back to the back to the fast and fun fun yes. round. If you could transmit a message that everyone would see sky written on a billboard wherever it would be what would that message say start saving early i would love to see that billboard all over the place good okay so jessica what is the one parenting and or money smarts book podcast or really i mean any media that you yourself go back to or that you give to people the most often so um my favorite book that I give to people often, and I think it's a good book for parents, and I think it's a good book for entrepreneurs, um, but it's not necessarily a money book, but I'll tie it to money because it has to do with career in my mind. It's a children's book called What Do You Do With an Idea by uh, Kobe Yamada. It's absolutely my favorite book, um, and my kids, I try to read it to them as much as they'll listen to it, but it's, 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 it's this like just a helpful book to all ages because the idea is that, you know, if you have this idea in the beginning of the book, it starts to follow this child and he can't get rid of the idea. And I felt like that with Pocket Nest in the early days. It was like, someone needs to build this, but it's not going to be me. And, you know, sure enough, the idea keeps following you and growing and it becomes more colorful until it's part of you. Um, and I just, I, you know, I think it's back to that follow your dreams. I think even if you get it wrong, um, start you know, whatever it is, just start. I'm going to write that down because um, my kids are older now, but I have, my brother has younger kids and we're always looking for presents. 
um, for them and, and useful ones and, and books are very often what we gift. So I'm going to take a look at this. Thank you. Good. And your daughters are not too old for it either. So I wouldn't hesitate to, you know, send them a copy too. Good. Okay. That sounds good. All right. So in closing, uh, Jessica, how can people find you on social media and or the web to the extent that you want them to find you there? <laughs> <laughs> we are everywhere. So um, Pocket Nest has this incredible CMO, um, our CMO, Ashley Craven. So she knows she gets us everywhere, everywhere. So we're on every bit of social media. Um, you can find me everywhere too. So our website is pocketnest.com. Um, but yeah, you'll, you can find us on every single piece of social media. <laughs> we're there. Great. Well, we'll put that all, that, all that will be in the show notes, of course, as well. And finally, what's one action that you'd like other people to take that would be helpful for you? Oh, well, we are always looking for customers. So, um, you know, we license to financial institutions. So any RIAs with retirement plan practices are really good clients for us, um, as well as employers. So if you want to try a financial wellness app, um, you know, I would encourage listeners to go to their employers and their HR groups and ask them to look into Pocket Nest um, for employee wellness. That would be, you know, that's our ask. We want to serve more people. Well, Jessica, that's great. And this was a terrific conversation. I appreciate all the knowledge bombs that you were dropping here. I think uh, our audience will appreciate them too. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it.